right so we are in section 16.3 this is the last section of chapter 16 we're going to talk about in this section we're going to actually look at a numerical example on how we're going to conduct a one-way one-factor analysis of variance or ANOVA now here what I have is uh, an excerpt from the book and this is in the book so I just want to show you what we're doing here so our purpose of course is to perform the hypothesis test and we are comparing several means here k population means k is an arbitrary number here we could be comparing three four five however many k might be so the assumptions are important here first the usual assumption we had throughout the, all of this is that we have ra simple random samples these samples must be independent and the distribution of the population is going to be of, on each of the population the distribution of variable random variable x is normal and finally assumption number four says that equal population standard deviations remember that's our within deviation that we assume to be equal just like we did in section 10.2 so the null hypothesis here says or reads that all the means are equal between the k population means and the alternative says that all the means are equal not all are the same alpha is our significance level and our test statistic is going to be an f ratio remember that one the f ratio here by the way is the ratio of mean squared remember that's the variance between that's mean squared for between uh, between divided by uh, the mean squared within so that's what this is mstr mse now in this book the author by the way uses the word treatment and the reason for that is because when sir ronald fisher was working with ANOVAs and discovered them and actually uh, a lot of the work that he did in, with his research his data these were agricultural data so in the field of agriculture I believe treatment would be something that you could apply to maybe a plot of land so he was actually comparing different treatments again treatments could be fertilizers it could be I don't know maybe oxygen uh, but uh, potassium nitrous whatever these might be so anyway the word treatment that has its roots from agricultural fields so the treatment is the between that we talked about earlier in previous section and the error the term error here means the source of variations that are within each sample or each population in the, and this is what the ANOVA table looks like okay so here uh, DF stands for degrees of freedom okay right in here DF stands for degrees of freedom SS stands for sum of squares and MS stands for mean squared mean square so mean square that's the average variance remember the average variability is sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom and the F ratio is here of course now for each of these uh, we'll go through a numerical example I'll show you how we actually get a table like this so remember K is the number of groups we are comparing number of population means if you will degrees of freedom for between is going to be number of populations minus one and this would use uh, this is there's formulas actually for com computing these but i won't even show you those formulas since we're not using um, our own formulas we're going to use the stat crunch okay and our decision rule we're just going to go off of the p-value in this one okay remember if p-value is less than or equal to alpha right up here we're going to reject the null hypothesis so that's the same as before okay now let's actually go further and I just want to point out also here since we're not going to do any exercise by hand this is going to go quickly 
so I have time to tell you other stuff. Okay, uh, an ANOVA is simply an extension of a pool t-test that we did in the earlier section of section 10.2. That's what an ANOVA is. Okay, and uh, just to show you what I mean by that. So we're looking at section 10.2 and ex an example actually I grabbed from section 10.2 and in that section if you recall we assumed the deviations were equal but unknown. Okay, so um, looking at this example that's on page 442 what the author is doing is actually looking at uh, the case where he's comparing two population means and uh, uh, he's trying to compare the salary of a faculty in private institutions versus the average salary in the public institutions. Okay, private versus public. So he gets the samples from two institutions. And here's the null hypothesis. Remember, this is chapter 10, section 2, something we've already done before. I just want to show you the relevance, the relevance of what we do in chapter 16 to chapter 10. So the null hypothesis here says the means are equal. The average salaries between private and public institutions are the same. The alternative here says that they are different. And of course, um, he goes through and works the formula. The formula should be familiar to you. And here, this SP, remember, pooled variance. This is under the assumption the deviations were equal. So this is an estimate of that equal but unknown standard deviation is 25, which in dollars would be $25,000. This is a test statistics, and the test statistic is 2.395. There's no units on this, by the way, so it's not dollars or anything like that. That's just a T-score, like a Z-score. And the p-value, let's say he used technology, probably stat crunch, and he got p-value to be 0196, and 01 is less than 05, so we're going to reject the null hypothesis. That means the two means are different. So in other words, the average pay in a private institution is different from public institution. And if you take a look at uh, the averages here, this is in private versus public institution. Of course, these are based on samples. So this sample average is 88,000 private institution versus 73,000 in a public institution. The difference is private institution, they make 15,000 more per year. So that difference of $15,000 more was statistically significant. Okay. And if you look at the deviations in the sample, by the way, you see how they're pretty close, 24,000, 26,000. That's not bad. <clears throat> so, again, this is all in Chapter 10. What does that have to do with Chapter 16 and the ANOVA, right? So, let's see. In Chapter 16, I went ahead and I ran the ANOVA for this. And you'll see something interesting here. You see some commonalities here that I have highlighted. Okay, so here's the run from StatCrunch. So up here you get the descriptive statistics that were actually given by the author. See these numbers? These numbers are the same as these numbers up here. So you're getting all of these numbers down here. These are just the statistics. Okay, now look at the ANOVA table, the analysis of variance source columns error or total now here's another variation in stat crunch they call the source um, column here columns that's the same as treatment in your textbook and that's the same as the between uh, samples okay so and the error of course is within now if you look at these numbers, here's your p-value. And look at the p-value here. They're identical. You see that? P-value from ANOVA table. And this is p-value, remember, in chapter 10. Chapter 10, we didn't mention the word ANOVA. So it's interesting. You get identical results. And what's interesting here is this number 25.19 in green 
if you divide this number means squared that's if you divide actually this number by this number you get 63478 if you um, this is mean squared error and if you actually let's see let me pause this and just make sure that these numbers are correct okay I'm back so what I've done here was this this was actually an error um, if you take the square root of 634.78 you get 25.19 which is precisely what the number in green is that was your pooled uh, deviation so this number again square root of that number is going to be an estimate of Sigma that's what that is the number itself 635 almost that would be an estimate of the variance common variance and this is what I was telling you about again in section 16.2 uh, the assumption that the variances are equal within the two here subgroups we can actually use Levine's test the p-value here is pretty large and uh, the p-value here large that means we don't reject at all what this p-value is testing is testing the hypothesis that the two deviations are equal okay and uh, p-value is large so we're not going to reject the null the null says they are equal so yeah it's reasonable to assume that these two deviations are the same in the population although they look different in the samples okay and we'll see this again in our own example so you can just want to point out my p-values are exactly the same as the p-value that you got in section 10.2 and again this is this has nothing to do with chapter 16 i just want to show the connection between section 10.2 and chapter 16 ANOVA and this is the reason in fact we jumped all the way from chapter 10 to chapter 16 it's for this very reason so now let's actually take a look at the rest of this is going to go quickly because we're just going to use a stat crunch we're not going to do any number crunching by hand so what do we want to do <clears throat> we want to compare several means and of course we're doing a one factor ANOVA to compare the means for several population so here's our test statistic our F ratio ratio of variability between groups to variability within groups and this is our ANOVA table now in this table again remember the row that reads treatment here source treatment that's between the error is within degrees of freedom is number of population minus one k is the number of population n is the overall sample size okay so let's say you have three groups the sample sizes are 10 20 30 the combined sample sizes that would be 10 plus 20 plus 30 is 60 so that's what n is it's the overall the total number of observations in all groups and these formulas again sst or sse sst you don't know how to calculate these the software will give us the whole thing and mst here ms means mean squared you get your mean squared for any row for each row by dividing SS in that row sum of square by degrees of freedom and that's how you get these mean squares and that's what these are okay and the final F ratio is when you divide MSTR by MSE and there will be a p-value that you don't see in this table now we do have this uh, one factor ANOVA identity that reads sum of squared total is equal to sum of squared treatments plus sum of squared error okay so in other words this total right in here up here is given by SSE plus SSTR that gives you the grand total down here and again that's sum of squared between samples plus sum of squared within samples now let's do an exercise together here so in this exercise we want to complete this ANOVA table now we are given we are given a portion of the table we want to fill in the blanks okay so where are the blanks in this one uh, right in here right here right here and in here those are 
the missing information we want to fill in okay now remember mean square I have it on the right the mean squared that's when you divide sum of square by degrees of freedom so in the first row here I have SS sum of a square is missing for treatment well if you go back in what we have here sum of a squared is when you multiply a mean square by degrees of freedom that comes from this uh, earlier expression from this expression so what I need to do is in fact now we can complete this table together okay so to do let's say SST so we want to do this part right here so SST I'm going to multiply the mean squared which is 21 0.562 by 2 and that becomes 43.124 okay that's 43.124 so we got that missing part now in order to get oh the other thing we want to get is the total sum of squared that's this one right here the total sum of squares when we add up the two numbers above it directly above it uh, so that plus 84 4 now the number becomes 127.524 the other part that's missing now we want to do is this part right here now remember the total degrees of freedom that's the sum of the entries directly above it so that's going to be 12 because 12 and 2 make 14 so we answered this portion we answer that one we answer that so the next thing we want to do is to find mean squared error right up here to find mean squared error you divide 84.4 divided by 12 and you get 7.03 okay and now we have done mean squared error the last thing that remains is our F ratio okay for f ratio that's when you do 21.652 by 7.03 21.652 divided by 7.03 that's going to be 3.8 3.08 around it and there you go we have completed the ANOVA table okay it looks like it looks like a puzzle huh solving a puzzle feels like it <laughs> let's try this one and again i have remember sum of a squared is equal to mean squared times degrees of freedom we had that from earlier also okay so for this one let's try first of all this right in here degrees of freedom for the total remember the last row is the sum of the two entries directly above it so that's going to be what 20 plus 4 that's 24 that was easy to get the sum of squared in that spot that's the sum of squared error we're going to multiply 6.76 times 20 and that's going to be 135.2 okay now remember this number 173 is the sum of those two entries directly above it so what we want to get now is we want to find this value sum of squared for treatment so i'm going to do 173.04 minus 135.2 and i get 37.84 37.84 to get the mean squared treatment i'm going to now divide 37.84 by 4 and that's 9.46 and finally finally to get these the f ratio the f statistic you divide 9.46 by 6.76 and the number is going to be 1.4 it's 1.399 if you want there you go which is about 1.4 okay so this is how you complete the table i believe one of your exercises has has you doing that in my math lab so you know how to do that one now hopefully okay let's put this to work now <laughs> let's put it to the test so here's an exercise from your book 
In this exercise, this is number 51 from your textbook. Okay, in exercise number 51, staph infections. So the problem reads, in the article using EDE, ANOVA, and regression to optimize some microbiology data. Journal of Statistics Education. Binney analyzed bacteria culture data collected by Cooper at the Auckland University of Technology, I believe Auckland, that should be New Zealand, I believe, maybe, maybe not. Okay, five strains of cultured Staphylococcus aureus bacteria that causes staph infections were observed for 24 hours at 27 degrees Celsius or centigrade. The following table reports bacteria counts in millions for different cases from each of the five strains so these are again bacteria counts in millions so that's nine million three million ten million and so on okay and here's a question to the right at five percent significance level remember that would be our alpha do the data provide sufficient evidence to conclude a difference exists notice the way this is stated a difference exists in the mean bacteria this becomes the alternative right remember the null says there is no difference between the means among the five strains of a staph virus okay or bacteria now here um, you don't need these numbers as I have it and highlighted you can ignore these and the reason because we're going to use a stat crunch okay but if you want to look at them there they are all right so here are the numbers so i ran uh, the anova in stat crunch which i'll show you in a moment how to do and i have written the null and alternative hypothesis here right there you go here's where we have the null and the alternative hypothesis okay now uh, up here actually what we're seeing strain a B, C, D, and E. These are actually statistics, right? It means numerical values obtained from the samples. Now, a few things to note here. First of all, the sample sizes are all equal, but they're small. The average bacteria count for strain A, about 21 million, versus 26 million, 37 million, 20 million, 39 million. So notice how different these means are, okay? So you would expect to reject the null hypothesis, right? Remember, the null says the means are the same. However, I'm looking at the p-value here, 0.1010%. We're not going to reject the null. And part of the reason, there are a couple of reasons for that. The one, again, small samples. And the other one is the deviations. Look at how deviations are not really equal, are they? 5.7 versus 18 so these are not quite the same so those are the two reasons small samples and deviations that are giving us large p-value otherwise the means are really different okay now also i'm looking at the means here and i have a few questions here there are your question marks i should say so if you look at the mean between strain a and d so strain A and D, the mean is 20.8, right? Strain A, 20.8, almost 21. And in D, uh, that would be 20. So these are pretty close, aren't they? So I have a question mark. Are those equal? Maybe. C equal E, maybe. Look at C, 37 million versus 39 million, pretty close. I mean, I know 2 million is quite a bit, but actually it's not as bad as it seems. Uh, statistically, these things could happen. So in the population, the question is, could they be the same? And finally, my other question I have is, how about if I look at the average between the strain D and E? Are those different in the population? Look at D and E, how different they are. This, the, the bacteria count in, in strain E is twice almost as, as many as in strain D. So they definitely cannot be equal. 
Now, these questions I have posed, we can actually answer these, but we're not going to cover that section. But if you want to read it on your own, this is section 16.4, multiple comparisons, multiple comparison section. Okay, so um, what that section does is look at the, a couple of procedures for deciding which means, if any, are different. Usually, after you reject the null, that means the means are different. The next natural step is to actually investigate and decide on the questions that I posed here. Which means could be the same, which ones could be different. Okay. And here is the ANOVA table. All the work that we did, the culmination of all our work comes right down here. This is what we're talking about in this section. That's all we want to do. Get the table and understand it. So remember again the columns here. And this is going to be what the author call, uh, called treatment. T-R-T-M, treatment. And uh, I called it between groups. And the error is the within groups. Okay, now look at this one. Um, all it comes down to, folks, is really this p-value. That's all I want you to know from this table. The p-value is 0 0.1027. It's not less than or equal. That's 10%. That's not less than 5%. So we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis and conclude that there is no difference in average or mean bacteria count among the five strains, oddly as it may seem. And that's it. That's chapter 16. That's all you got to do. Now, down below, I'm giving you a little extra again. This isn't part of this exercise, and it's not in the book, and you, won't, you will not be tested on this. But that assumption of homogeneity of variances I mentioned about, that's what this Levine's test is testing. And I have written down what that p-value exactly is testing right in here. This is testing the null hypothesis that all deviations are the same with, within the five strains of staff. Now, the p-value is about 2%. So at 05, on my own, I took it to be 05. At 05, we're going to reject that null. Remember, the null says ah, the deviations are equal. So these deviations are not really equal. huh? They are different. And we knew that because... Can look at the numbers up here. Look at them up here. See those? Those don't look the same. They're not close being the same. So now in the book, by the way, let me mention this. The way the author checks the assumption of equality of variances um, are a couple of ways he does it. One, he takes the ratio of largest to smallest deviation. So the largest deviation here was 18, right? Up here is 18. The smallest is 5.6. So if we take the ratio of those two numbers, that ratio is not going to be less than 2. It ends up being about 3 point something. The magic number is 2. Okay, 2 is the magic number here. If that ratio is less than 2, then we can assume variances are equal. So they're not in this case. Also, another way to do this is to look at the sample sizes. If the sample sizes are equal, then we are okay to make the assumption of equality. And in this case, look at the sample sizes. The sample sizes are all equal. So that's why uh, you say, okay, the deviations are equal, but they really, really are not equal, folks. I just want to show you this is rather than samples being equal, the Levine's test is a more valid um, means of assessing equality. But this procedure is fairly robust, by the way. Even though there's moderate variation to that assumption of equality of variances, uh, I guess the question is what do you mean by moderate, right? What quantifies moderate here? But anyway, uh, we're going to assume deviations are equal. So primary reason is because sample sizes are small. That's the primary reason we could not reject the null. And, and there you have it. So 
the only thing that remains is I need to show you how to do this in stat crunch, correct? So let's go back here. This is exercise number 51. So I'm going to go to stat crunch now. I'm sure now everybody's paying attention. <laughs> okay, so there I'm in stat crunch number 51. Okay, so I'm going to scroll down to data sets from chapter 10. Uh, no, we are chapter 16, right? There you go, chapter 16. And this was exercise number 51. There it is. Number 51. And we have these strings. Now notice, by the way, in StatCrunch, they appear in two forms, a column format. And of course, we have it um, where all the data is summarized in one column, the counts. You have another column for strings. Ignore the two columns here. We actually want to maintain the way you see it in here okay now in your homework by the way your homework and even on the exam if you're not given data that is in a matrix form you need to type it in you need to type these numbers in in a matrix form okay so this is the form you want to have it in now once it is in that form let's go and actually do ANOVA so we're gonna go to stat and then go down the list. Here's ANOVA. And what we're doing is we're doing one-way ANOVA in this course. That's the only one we're doing. One-way means one factor. Okay. So, uh, here we need to choose our columns. Okay. Now, we have five columns, right? A, B, C, D, and E. So, in order to select these, left-click once. And then in, down in here, by the way, let me go and uh, uh, you can see, well, see in here, right below the cursor, it says or reads, to select more than one, you can do that with shift click or control click. So I'm going to now hold the control button on my keyboard and left click once and, and keep that button, that control button depressed. Keep it clicked and left click, left click, left click once. Now you can let go of the control button. So that's how you select multiple entries. And that's all you gotta do. You don't have to worry about all the other stuff. And for in the options, by the way, don't check this, but if you do here, compute two key HSD, okay. Um, this is the next section, the multiple comparison that I mentioned, so you can ignore that. And if you click here, test homogeneity of variance using Levine's test, you get the output that I have. So just check that if you want or uncheck it, doesn't matter. And hit compute. And there you go. And again, if you ignore the, the bottom table, Levine's test for homogeneity of variance. Ignore that one. That's not in your book. Uh, and you get exactly the output that I got. And of course, here's your p-value. So remember, from this ANOVA, all you really want is that p-value, the very last column, which determines whether you reject or you do not reject. And that's pretty simple. Took a long time to get here, but once we got here, it's pretty easy. And with that, I believe we are done with this section. Just checking. Yep. So again, please go back to the beginning if you need more clarification on the things we've done. And with that, we are done with this chapter 16.